All right, we have everybody on. So now I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists. We have Mark Knight. Mark is a principal consultant consultant at 1898 and Company, a part of Burns and McDonald. Prior to joining Burns and McDonald, Mark was chief engineer at the Electricity Infrastructure Systems Group at the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, Monica Newcomb will be our second speaker on this panel. Monica is a senior policy advisor at the United States Department of Energy and currently leads the Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings, GEB, initiative for the Building Technologies Office. And our final presenter is going is Ajit Renjit, and I probably butchered that, Ajit, sorry. Dr. Uh, Renjit manages and conducts EPRI's strategic research on distributed energy resources, uh, management systems, and micro, micro grid integration. That was a mouthful. All right, uh, Mark, uh, please take it away. All right, thank you, uh, John. Um, so I want to go over the, uh, the background and bio, but uh, I have worked in a number of areas over the years. Um, currently, I'm focused on integrating asset management as a core competence of leveraging data for improved decision making, but I've been involved in transactive energy systems work um, quite a lot over the years, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'd like to thank NCEP for inviting me to participate and discuss a future with customer level markets. As you might guess from what I've already said, transactive energy systems are going to factor into this somewhere. It's not that I love the technical pieces of these systems. Um, in fact, far from it. Uh, my admittedly selfish goals as somebody who is grid connected is for my lights to keep coming on as we see grid changes over the next 20 years and beyond. So other than my title slide, this is uh, one of only two other slides that I have today. I don't plan to spend too much time on this one. This slide simply presents the overview for this session as it was described in the agenda. I'm gonna describe the second bullet in the next slide. In fact, I only included this slide so that we could take a look at the first bullet in a little more detail. For a short bullet, it actually contains some important concepts that are all been blended together. First of all, it mentions a more granular information or more granular information on electricity use. And more specifically, it mentions the exchange of data. I expect data exchanges to be critical for enabling customer level markets. Customers need to be clearly presented with options for pricing and services, and how the customer responds needs to be captured and ultimately verified. The bullet also refers to both electricity use and supply, recognizing the fact that customers will have the option to offer services as well as consumers. Finally, it recognizes, or I would argue that it recognizes there needs to be much more integration between the distribution system and the transmission system. Perhaps this is a good time briefly to jump into FERC uh, 2222 or FERC 2x4 as I heard it referred to recently. Um, I do feel totally out of my depth really bringing this up with this audience but as we know um, FERC's passed a, a long-awaited order to open up the country's wholesale energy markets to, to DER like rooftop solar behind uh, meter batteries and electric vehicles. This was described in yesterday's session by uh, Karen Hertzfeld and, and Dave uh, Kathan. Now comes the hard part though, creating market values um, and market rules that allow the DER to, to play in bulk energy markets while retaining the role um, of state regulation. It's been billed as a, a game changer, but I was actually reading an interesting post from one of my colleagues recently. Um, he noted that average wholesale price for power is in the $35 to $40 a megawatt range, net metering provides between $83 and $200 a megawatt hour. Why he posited, would anybody be crazy enough to throw away $200 to get 40? Uh, he thinks that FERC 2222 will have little impact on legacy DER. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I, I think this is a, a great step uh, and certainly from a transactive energy perspective, um, you know, I, I'm excited about this. <clears throat> Um, yesterday, Sarah Hoffman asked a good question about net metering in the session on uh, operational considerations for dis distribution level markets with Paul D. Martini and Ann Hoskins. So if transactive energy and, and DER markets are something that interests you, um, 
if there's a recording from that session, I'd, I'd highly recommend going back and, and listening to that. So if we go on to my uh, only real slide with content, uh, please. So moving on, um, I told you this would be short. So how do we lever leverage customer level resources to support grid needs? I'm gonna phrase that in terms of requirements. Uh, one reason is because I spent most of my life working on various uh, types of projects. And they all boil down to identifying requirements. And secondly, I used to work for a company um, a few years or a few decades ago where our legal counsel used to search all of our documents for words like needs. And that always triggered a, uh, a change to stated requirements and a lecture on not using words like needs. So I guess that's uh, stuck with me um, a long time. So I think we can boil this conversation down into four topics. They're all pretty straightforward, but as we go through these bullets, they, they actually get more complicated. So. Does it matter where the customers are? Absolutely. If we're looking at future customer level markets, that means we're dealing with flows on the distribution system caused by movements of power to provide services. If these actions are not coordinated, then we may cause system imbalances and stress on the grid. The Gridwise Architecture recently published two papers uh, looking at aspects of this. One was smart buildings as transactive energy hubs but the other looks at reliability and resilience considerations for transactive energy systems. And it offers a, a model of responses that a grid system might need to make um, to avoid, resist, or recover from an event. And it pairs these with responses um, with normal stressed or emergency grid conditions under which those uh, responses can be planned or activated. So where the customer is or where the customers are is most definitely important. It gets more challenging if you consider the existence of multiple transactive energy systems or cu multiple customer level markets where next door neighbors might be participating in different markets. Paul Martini yesterday discussed the complexity of the grid tapestry and the complex coordination that's necessary uh, while he was discussing his work with Jeff Taft. So that brings me to the second point. So what customers can do really depends on the responses they can provide that is to, to grid conditions and to market signals. But there may be different markets. So while what customers can do may be defined by a specific capability at any point in time, finding out that capability may not be so easy. Just because a customer has a responsive load does not mean that they've offered it into the market today. And even if they have, which market did they bid that into? And who has visibility across multiple markets to have a coordinated, or rather a consolidated view of what customers can do to support the grid. I guess the bullet says what they can do, um, not who has, vis who has visibility. So if we simplify that, I guess customers can do a lot. Back in 2013, uh, the IEEE Power and Energy Society published a report called the IEEE Grid Vision 2050, which was intended to provide guidelines and priorities related to standards development, especially for ongoing and future working groups in the areas of generation, transmission, distribution, and importantly, end use of electricity. It proposed a simple abstraction of the grid that I've, I've used before, which is asserting that there's only three things we can do with power. We can make it, we can move it, and we can use it. Anything else we do is simply a combination of one or more of these actions. So moving electricity is what we do, or what we use wires for. So applying simple set theory to that IEEE model would imply that non-wires alternatives involves simply making and using power. If we go on and further assume that moving power means that it needs to be moved to minimum threshold and probably also involving voltage changes, this implies at least to me that non-wise alternatives requires making and using power within a limited area. In other words, it implies that non-wise alternatives are a way to balance supply and demand locally. Transactive energy systems are a system of economic and control mechanisms that allow the dynamic balance of supply and demand. With the penetration of DER being largely at the edge of the grid, this means that it's also a local balancing issue. So this implies to me that transactive energy systems should be a great fit for implementing non-wires alternatives in order to integrate DER. And that means customer level markets. So that's a long response to my second bullet, but as I said, the bullets got, get more difficult as you, as you go down. Um, the big problem with the next bullet is the need for a crystal ball. We know, the grid is changing, but what will these changes do to the balance of supply and demand? And how will this influence the support we need to provide the grid? In terms of customer level markets, we can provide value between the participants, but we need to do this in a way that's not detrimental to the grid. I know that's obvious, 
But if the transactions between customers disrupt the grid, then it also impacts the market. We can't have customer level markets without the grid. So how can we enable markets that don't impact the grid if we don't know what the future grid requirements will be? One way is to create approaches that simplify the relationships and create standardized ways and provide um, to provide uh, responses to market signals. One of these approaches was part of the Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Lab Consortium Program and now has a home within a task force at CEPA. And that's the concept of the Energy Services Interface or ESI. The intent of this is to help DER owners and operators by simplifying their interactions with a potentially large and diverse set of external parties, while still allowing their internal systems to be maintained and evolve separately across a range of DER technologies. Um, I was going to go over the definition of an ESI. I think we can skip that because it, it's a fairly long one. Um, but it, it revolves around um, the, de, you know, the ESI being the interaction with a grid at a facility. And that, that defines the boundary of the customer's devices and systems. So to be grid responsive, um, they need to use automation to, to manage their operation. Um, so introducing the concept of that facility management function um, we generalized the idea that der equipment has some intelligent coordination aspect i hope that was clear i skipped a couple of things i meant to cover in that but um, it's also a good segue i think to the final point which is how to leverage the resources the real challenge there is how do you leverage resources when you don't know what you might need as always i find it good to go back to uh, basic principles and the ieee PES make, move, use model helps here. I consider um, distributed generation responsive loads and storage all to be DER. Going back to my earlier comment, this simply means using the resources to create value for the participants while balancing local supply and demand, which is what transactive energy systems provide. So it means allowing customers to make their own choices, providing coordination of actions um, so that they don't stress the grid. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a, a couple of recent Gridwise Architecture Council papers that are relevant here. Um, one on smart energy uh, or smart buildings as um, transactive energy hubs. And um, I think uh, Monica is going to discuss more about buildings and their roles in a minute. So um, wasn't checking the time, but hopefully uh, I'm fairly close. So uh, I think I'll, I'll wrap up there and take any specific TE questions later. Okay, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, Monica, would you like to give your presentation, please? Sure, great. Um, thanks, Mark, and thanks to NCP for um, allowing me to participate in this panel today. I look forward to discussion and questions later. Um, just a, a, a quick background. So I work in the Buildings Technologies Office, um, and we focus on buildings. And so there's also the Office of Electricity, and they're really the ones um, that work more with grid requirements and, uh, and markets, but we do work closely together on this effort, um, which we call, grid, we call Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings, or GEB. Um, and really the idea behind GEB is allowing um, customers and buildings and the different end uses in buildings, which might also be batteries or electric vehicles, um, to provide flexibility um, in energy use and grid operation. Um, so traditionally, I have worked on energy efficiency, and most of us in the Buildings Technologies Office have focused on energy efficiency. Um, but over the last few years, we've really started looking at, um, in addition to buildings being able to persistently reduce energy reductions um, or energy use, um, to also change the, the timing and amount of energy use, uh, depending on um, sort of grid, I, I will say grid needs here, um, perhaps it should be grid requirements. Um, we started this work because a lot of the states uh, that we work with have, uh, you know, we're exploring capacity issues as well as grid modernization, um, especially with a focus on increased renewables and increasingly decarbonization strategies. Um, in addition to that, of course, we work with manufacturers um, and a lot of the data trends there are pointing towards um, smart devices just becoming a lot much larger part of the market are really the norm in the future. Um, uh, and so with that, there's just this, uh, I think, great opportunity for smart energy management, um, both for energy efficiency and demand flexibility. Um, and so the, our, our grid interactive efficient buildings work, um, you know, some people might call smart buildings, I, know, I noticed Mark, you mentioned that several times, 
you might hear active energy efficiency, you know, even virtual battery um, or DR 2.0. Um, a lot of that sort of many of those things, maybe there are some unique pieces, but a lot of it encompasses the same idea of um, in increased load flexibility. Um, the way we characterize a GEB is really sort of four key characteristics. As I mentioned before, we're, um, for us, sort of the backbone really is efficiency still driving on that persistent low energy use. But then in addition, um, the ability to be connected, to have two-way uh, communications between flexible technologies, the grid and occupants. Um, really the idea of smartness, being able to use data analytics, um, uh, machine learning, uh, input of a number of different, you know, whether it's occupant comfort, prices, weather, et cetera, so be able to look across um, a number of inputs and then being able to have um, flexibility. So being able to reduce, shift, or modulate energy use and taking advantage of um, flexible loads and distributed generation or storage. Uh, so maybe we want to go to the, the next slide here. Um, and I would say all of those character, characteristics really point us then to a direction of an optimized approach to demand flexibility. Um, there, there's definitely an open question in my, my mind still of sort of where that optimization lives. I think um, just realistically today, most of uh, demand response or demand flexibility really is at the device level. We see flight, uh, fleets of aggregation. Um, but at, from our perspective at BTO, we really want to try to be building out our work um, so you can have optimization up at the building level if it ends up that that is the level of optimization that is needed. So the ability for devices to be able to interact even within a building um, and potentially even optimization across a, a group of buildings. Um, and, and, you know, I, I often sort of ask like sort of the spectrum of where, where we are today. Um, and I would say realistically, we're, we're sort of at um, either largely today, you know, still direct load control um, or sort of single device aggregation. Um, there's a, a great uh, opportunity still for increased automation and this optimization. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I was actually reading, I saw a utility dive article today that came across, it was something like, I think, um, thousands of California homes um, are going to be aggregated to 550 megawatts um, for a virtual power plant, the largest in, in North America. And that was um, through with Ohm Connect largely, but um, really that, that's just millions of devices being aggregated um, there. And so um, de we're definitely, I would think from a, from a GEP perspective, we're, we um, are still sort of at the beginning level um, or beginning stages of we're thinking to the spectrum of all the way towards the transactive uh, market that, that Mark was discussing. Um, and then maybe to expand a little bit on some of the um, points that Mark made sort of about the opportunity and, and sort of where, where the need is. Um, right now, I, we are working on a national get potential, but really, um, and, and that's just to sort of look at the ballpark of the opportunity, I think where it really gets interesting and where people are more focused is sort of at the regional level um, and unfortunately, that, that potential really changes per region, um, depending on your renewables that you might um, have on board, uh, capacity, and even, you know, we're seeing um, an increasing number of localities sort of looking at electrification, which of course will be um, changing things and um, driving different needs for load flexibility. Um, and then of course, if you go further from region, you go down to even at the distribution level, um, the needs are gonna change as well too. Um, so maybe another way to look at this is a uh, sort of opportunity from a technology perspective. And, and there we see definitely a number of um, technologies that are stacking up as having great potential. I'll just knock through a few of those. Um, I think from the residential perspective, one of the easiest ones and familiar ones are green interactive water heaters. Um, you know, that's sort of an easy way to shed and shift. There's not a ton of um, interaction. Uh, with consumers there with changing preferences and there's also the opportunity for some um, storage with the water, thermal storage. And then the other just really big opportunity in both residential and commercial are heating and cooling. And there we see, um, you know, with pre-cooling for an hour or two, typically there's, there's quite a bit of opportunity for shedding or shifting um, of energy. Um, and then more at the commercial level, there's opportunities with lighting, so reducing the amount of um, lighting, um, as well as in some opportunities, refrigeration at the commercial level. Um, and then I think there, there is a great opportunity with appliances or electronics, sort of miscellaneous load. Um, 
and you know that typically is uh, changes around um, your sort of scheduling or if there are integrated batteries there's opportunities there to change the timing of the appliance um, or electronics and then um, so those are all sort of technologies that uh, exist today um, and then definitely some areas of research at least um, I know that we're funding around thermal storage ideas um, and you know phase change materials more of like changes where the envelope of the building can contribute to um, in a more passive approach um, releasing energy as needed and helping store it um, and then you know I, I think that mark actually mentioned on a number of these challenges that we're finding um, even though um, we do think there's quite a quite a great opportunity with uh, technologies that exist today um, we do think that they need to become more cost effective and really the cyber cybersecurity and interoperability challenges do need to be addressed. Um, I think, you know, there's the interoperability, interoperability between the building and the grid, and then even um, the ability of devices to um, communicate within a building is a challenge. And until uh, we address some of those challenges, it's directly released, uh, directly connected to the cost effectiveness. Um, and so driving down the costs, um, a key part of that will be um, improving interoperability of devices. Um, you know, I, I think a huge challenge uh, is around incentives, frankly. Right now, there really aren't a lot of incentives for consumers, um, either price-based or incentive-based, uh, you know, to, to make them want to change the timing of their energy use, um, as well as perhaps incentives for utilities that maybe could help address some of that. And then, um, you know, I, I think there is a great need or, um, yeah, need for uh, in, in education uh, with consumers on um, the way that these technologies, these smarter technologies could be used, um, as well as just sort of uh, ongoing maintenance. So from a workforce perspective too, um, in order for the, the technologies to be optimized on, um, on a regular basis, there's definitely some education um, needs there. And lastly, uh, as we know from energy efficiency, policies and financing options are really important to helping accelerate these technologies. Um, and the same thing could be said for um, demand flexibility. Um, and then maybe the last slide I'll, I'll end on here is just um, in addition to those challenges, uh, and I think there's a few clicks that, should, sorry, it was animated. I should have changed that. Um, you know, talking to a lot of different stakeholders is just this um, desire to have greater validation of the of the the technologies as well as just um, proof that these resources will show up when, when needed. And so uh, we definitely are looking into doing more validation of the individual technologies and are really excited about the connected communities funding opportunity announcement we have out right now. Um, so this is 65 million. Um, that we are hoping to be able to fund pilots across the nation to explore a lot of these, um, these challenges, looking at different solution sets in different um, climates, in different regulatory um, you know, areas, um, different sets of renewables on the grid, et cetera. So really excited for the integration across the devices and controls and the different technologies. We're hoping that there'll be some different business models that come out of this. Um, and they'll be really exploring some of these issues around um, consumer benefits as well that I discussed as a challenge. And we really hope the utilities and developers see this as a great opportunity as well um, to pilot some of their work and see how um, you know, consumer devices can help um, with, with their needs too. So that might be a, a nice segue to hear a little bit more about EPRI's um, work in this space. Thank you, Monica. Uh, just before we uh, final, uh, finish this panel with Ajit, I want to encourage uh, everyone in the audience to please enter any of your questions that uh, you'd like to have answered into the chat function. And with that, um, Ajit, let's uh, visit a little bit about DERMS. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Hello? Yes, we can. Yeah. So thank you all for taking the time to join. Um, my name is Sajit. I'm with the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, I lead research on the area of DER 
control systems, uh, particularly. Uh, okay. Uh, particularly in the area of uh, active management of DERs, and uh, uh, there was a request to share my screen, share my video. Can you guys see my video, or is it still not showing up? We can see you. We we okay. have your presentation. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, so I, I lead research in the area of DER control systems, which is the software control systems that actively manage distributed energy resources. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the work the industry has collectively done in the area of these management systems, where it started, where how it has progressed over the last decade, and where we are today. Um, can you go to the next screen? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The, Thanks for the graphic. So uh, where it all started was the definition of common functions for distributed energy resources. So people on this call must be very much aware of uh, smart inverters. DERs traditionally, uh, un, um, legacy DERs were not smart. And the last decade that has tremendous amount of effort and work from the industry to push the limits in terms of making DERs smart, smart in the sense enabling common functions in distributed energy resources. These have been standardized and also enabling communication protocols like different protocols DERs can speak, including SunSpec, DNP 2030.561850 to ensure uh, DERs can speak um, a common language. Um, another uh, um, another um, aspect that has happened uh, over the period of um, uh, the last three, four years, is grid codes have evolved to implement these smart functions. So you have California's Rule 21, Hawaii's 14H, uh, Interconnection Standard 15, 47, 2018, which is predominantly followed by most of the North American utilities adopting these standards. And of course, stress procedures are out there. 1547.1 is there. 1741SA has been published. And we are seeing, starting to see certifications being provided for smart DERs. So the context here is DER devices are ready, um, certification procedures are ready. Um, so DERs can get deployed with standard common functions. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what you see here is the same evolution where you see DER devices um, with smart functions are already uh, has already evolved and between the ages of 2008 to 2012 most of the work industry research has been undetected and now if you can um, do two more clicks uh, what has happened is utility started being interested in integrating DERs with their operational control systems particularly distribution management systems outage management systems because DERs as they become part of the distribution grid you need to understand what impacts that they cause and what type of uh, solutions that you need to ensure that could that the impacts could be addressed. And uh, one of the innovation at that point was distribution managed, particularly the DMS vendors came to the, uh, came to the conclusion that DERs also need to be managed and utilities needs to have a control system in place to manage the ERs. And that was the birthplace of DERMS or DER management systems. And so far there's been a tremendous amount of work and research in the industry in terms of identifying the functions that a DERMS can enable. And it is, has been endless and it's going on. Um, next slide, please. So um, maybe a few clicks here. So this is a summary of the last two slides. The grid oriented functions are ready. DERs are ready, DERs with smart functions are ready. Grid oriented services are already defined. Both distribution utilities and bulk system operators have traditional services. The services are very well defined. So they are not going to change any of the service definitions. The services are already there. So what is missing? The missing piece is the link between enabling these disparate resources to provide common set of services. So why? This, this link is needed or why DERMS is needed. That's what's uh, explained here in this slide uh, because you will have uh, thousands or millions of devices in your area to control. Uh, and these are going to be uh, different makes, different types, 
uh, different models. So that becomes a challenge because grid service needs are going to be grid aligned DER services and uh, there has to be very, very much aligned with the aligned with the needs of the grid. But devices may be operating, providing customers specific comfort, um, um, their own benefits, which are because these most of these DERs are deployed by the customers. So there is a need to align the needs of the grid with the device capabilities and what they can provide. Uh, the next thing is complex settings. DERs come with different types of settings, uh, different functions. EVs comes with um, uh, EV, EVs need to be managed uh, based on their charge discharge profile. Thermostat needs to be uh, managed based on te temperature settings. PV needs to be managed based on curtainment. So each of these DERs have device specific functions which are complex. But what you need, the grid, what the grid needs is simple services. Services like energy, capacity, regulation, which are simple. Um, so that conversion needs to happen. I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay, I'll, I'll keep moving. And the last one is DER type specific interactions. These are type specific while the grid services are energy oriented or the net services. Um, ne next, next slide, please. Um, this is another interpretation of what I just mentioned, which is what DERMS does is aggregating the capabilities of these disparate resources with different capabilities, different operational features and functions and provide simple set of services to the bulk system operators or the distribution operators who are in need of grid services. And what a DERMS does is four core functions. One, it aggregates. It can aggregate a fleet of resources based on location or other different types of uh, attributes. Uh, it simplifies the services. As I mentioned, the services provided at the, by the device are device type specific. So you need simplified grid service specific functions at the bulk system or the distribution system. So it abstracts the functional capabilities of the DERs and provides simplified services to the grid operators. It optimizes. I mean, um, uh, different DERs have different capabilities. Their capabilities may be different at different time of the day. So you need the control system to optimize the services so that it increases the lifetime of these DER resources and the grid. The last thing is translation. The devices speak different languages. So you may have to translate the languages spoken by the DERs to languages that the grid service and requesting entities can understand. Um, DSOs, TSOs may be speaking languages like ICCP or D uh, speaking the same language. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I don't want to belabor the conversation here uh, with going into the details of every single function. Uh, the bottom line I wanted to mention here is the industry has come across a long way in defining what these group level functions are, what these device level functions are, and uh, both of them apply to a DER management system. To In its upstream, it should speak group level functions, which are specific set of functions meant for group services, which are different from device level functions, which devices can speak, and there's a long list. And feel free to connect with me if you want to learn more about what these individual functions are and how it applies to DERMS and how it is different from, from device level functions. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, similar to functions, the protocols have also evolved. So what you see in this table, the right hand side are device level functions. All these um, device level functions and device level communication protocols. Uh, things like Modbus DNP 2030.5 are device specific functions and they are now mandated in grid codes like 1547-2018, California Rule 21. Uh, now they are part of test procedures like 1547.1, 1741-SA and SunSpec Alliance has specific test procedure and certification procedure for devices. Then on the left hand side what you see are what is applicable for groups DR aggregations. This is particularly for the upstream side of a DERM so control system. And there again, protocols are very specific. There are standards like 61968-5, which are already standardized and uh, been part of, and there are specific test frameworks and certification procedures to, um, for this group level functions. Next slide, please. Okay, um, 
so the the derms function evolution has today transformed into meeting many of the FERC requirements order particularly laid out in the rule uh, rule making of order double two double two what it is particularly uh, the FERC order double two double two identifies a number of requirements and uh, today the industry has been particularly in the from the derms perspective we are trying to address some of the concerns or some of the operational challenges raised by the order double two double two and um, derms requirements are needs to be updated to meet these coordination challenges that is put forth by the fur order double two double two and these derms requirements may apply to a certain extent to distribution utilities or the dsos or certain cases it may apply to the aggregation aggregating entities of the der aggregators who will be the entities who may aggregate a fleet of customer resources next slide please um so this is an initiative that's going on uh, we, we've worked for almost eight years now in terms with a predominantly driven by the industry distribution utilities bulk system operators consulting uh, consulting firms national labs and what we have is uh, a common set of definitions for tso's to coordinate with dso's and dso's to coordinate with iso's and the aggregators and um, this is an evolution it's not complete yet now, um, one, of the, one of the good things is the entities um, involved have been parallelly working with the necessary standards bodies to st standardize these functions and many of these functions are uh, meeting already meeting the requirements of order 2222 and we are continuously working with the industry to identify new functions and meet all the requirements laid out in 2222 um, another last thing i wanted to mention is uh, this helps uh, reference implementations when you are doing any type of planning studies interconnection studies some of the functions that are getting listed here also helps um, imp implementing as in, in being implemented as part of your interconnection studies and being uh, analyzed um, next slide please that may be the last one yeah i mean uh, feel free to take a look at this report um, uh, this is the latest version of this report i can send you a version it's publicly available uh, talks about all the necessary tso to use a coordination function pertaining to uh, control systems managing the ers um that i think yeah i think i have a couple of more slides um this is another way of viewing these different terms functions uh, and who and with, with respect to the time frames, I mean, uh, some of you know, for when it comes to TSO DSO interactions, these functions are not just applicable at the at the time of operation. This is applicable at different time frames. Some of them are applicable applicable pre-event. Some of them are applicable in the day ahead market time frame. So one of the approaches that you will see in this report is also categorizing these functions and applying it across different time frames and um, accordingly based on the time frame you will also see who's that in what are the necessary entities who are being part of this conversation the tso and the dso or the dso and the aggregator and so on so uh, that kind of delineation helps which function has to reside where and what domes needs to do to address those requirement um, next one and uh, associated with this document uh, is this um, uh, is this spreadsheet where uh, once um, this working group uh, convened one of the things that we did as an extension to the requirements development was uh, you can click a couple of times more there are a couple of uh, animations yeah, it's just um, a detailed spreadsheet addressing do it per, essentially doing a gap analysis of derms requirements and seeing what to what extent FERC ordered 20 to 22 requirements are already um, already um, addressed and what are those which are yet to be addressed so the industry can come together identify them and address them and one of the things that we are parallelly working on is also to ensure coordination with standardization entities as i said there's already a lot of standardization work happened in the um iuc i uh, areas but we want to continuously work with the industry boards and uh, keep them informed about this uh, work and uh, standardize these functions as we progress uh, that is it from my end i think that must be my last slide um, any questions feel free to okay thanks ajit uh, we're now going to start the Q&A portion. 
Uh, please, uh, audience members, send uh, your uh, questions to Danielle in the chat function. And our first question is for, uh, from the audience is for uh, Monica. And Monica, what is the BAS in the on the GEB graphic? What does that stand for? Uh, great question. We actually, believe it or not, spent a lot of time trying to identify how we should label that. Um, really what that is supposed to be depicting is, um, this is where I, I commented on the optimization and where the optimization occurs, if it's for the whole building, sort of a supervisory control level or more at the device level. And so um, when we think about Geb and the work that we are doing, we want to try to bring it all the way up to the supervisory level. So that is what that is um, supposed to um, be getting out there. Okay, thanks. Um, our second question is, are there things that PUCs, uh, state energy offices, and others could be doing to support the gaps mentioned around cybersecurity and interoperability? And we'll just throw that out for uh, any of the panelists to uh, answer. Ajit, you're on uh, mute. Sorry about that. Let me, uh, I think I can, you can, guys can hear me now. Um, yes, we, the industry has to come together in terms of addressing some of the cybersecurity challenges. Uh, DERs are currently uh, getting communicate, get, connect, communicating with utilities, communicating with um, DER aggregation platforms deployed by aggregators. Uh, but predominant, predominantly at the distribution side, we don't have any cybersecurity standards established yet. Uh, one good thing that has happened so far is 1547 has laid out the interoperability requirements or the communication standards requirements, uh, but that is just communication standards. It's not com inter cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, cybersecurity work has to happen. There is some effort happening in California already, looking at um, deploying some secure ways of communicating with the ERs, um, but uh, that there are current gaps, there are current issues in terms of uh, addressing those gaps. So um, the industry has to expand in terms of not just addressing interoperability, which the industry has done for DERs, but also looking into the cybersecurity aspect. There's a lot of work to be done in this space. Okay, thanks. Uh, our next question, it sounds like there's a vision for DERs and GEBs to provide grid services and technical capabilities. What could state PUCs or state energy offices or governors do to further enable the device devices to offer these services for utilities to leverage these devices? Anyone want to take a shot at that one? Sure, I can start there. Um, as I, I mentioned, uh, I really think just a critical challenge right now and you know, is the fact there aren't very many incentives in place um, for customers. And I, I think really there has to be some changes either with rates or um, programs in order to get the um, number numbers up that I think would actually make a meaningful difference. Okay, thanks, Monica. Our next question is, what are the implications for DER management systems if we were to create a national uh, high voltage DC overlay with local off ramps? Oh, uh, I'm trying to think of how to answer that question. So I think um, when it comes to high voltage DC, or any type of technologies that are going to impact or transition the grid from a bulk system perspective. Um, uh, I think that, that there are definitely that is going to impact DER management systems, but uh, at present, the way we have structured the conversation or definition of DERMS is DERMS manages DERs. And there are traditional grid management systems. When it comes to distribution, it's, there is DMS. When it comes to bulk system, there is EMS. So that's that's not something we are going to disturb. Uh, the grid managing entities are going to be there. Yeah, that's, that, that is, uh, and of course, there has to be capabilities that needs to be enabled in these grid management systems in terms of making them DER aware 
or GRI or or uh, or uh, DR aware in terms of making a DR aware DMS or a DR aware EMS. Definitely, that work is happening. Um, so uh, when you talk about any type of like a HVDZ type of transition that's happening, I think it's definitely going to impact the EMS or the EMS mostly, uh, particularly the EMS mostly. And uh, that will uh, and that implication on DERMS, uh, in my opinion, is something that we need to study. Uh, it's not something uh, we have already answered, and that's not something that we have thought the industry has thought about yet. But definitely, uh, the service definitions between the EMS and the DERMS needs to be rethought uh, in terms of uh, some of the services that's defined. So most of the services that the DERMS currently does or has been defined for the DERMS are for traditional grid services and um, tradition and, and traditionally um, uh, or for ems that tradition how it manages the uh, uh, manages the grid the traditional way thanks ajit uh now we have a a question for all of you and we'll start with uh, uh, the answers with mark the question is do we have examples of retail or customer level markets today what are the communication needs to support the exchange of information across distribution and transmission system and what type of data is needed to support the growth of these technologies and markets? There are pilots out there. Um, well, there have been a few. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, my, my I mean, if, if you if kind of stepping back, if you, if you, you know, the, the three phase model that Paul Martini uses, you know, the, the kind of phase one, two and three, where we're in kind of phase two with uh, moderate to high level of DER adoption, you know, the distributed markets are going to appear at three. So right now we're seeing pilots and um, concepts. Um, my big concern is that, um, you know, we're not ready enough when we actually get to the tipping point and this stuff does take off. So in terms of the types of data, you know, it's going to depend on, you know, the types of services, the types of capabilities of equipment, um, the, the kind of temporal aspects of things, um, how soon, how far ahead people can, can, um, can buy or bid services. Um, what are the, uh, how long do they, uh, do they apply for? Um, and then the whole, um, you know, there's got to be a measurement um, and verification process in place because, you know, going back to the, the early work from GWAC, um, you know, market participants have to be responsible for their actions. So if you're committing to, uh, tr to transactions, um, you've got to be, uh, you know, you've got to make sure you actually deliver them. So we've got to be able to, sh to, to validate that. I think there's a whole nother level as well around quality of information and how you determine, um, you know, who to buy from and, and who to sell to in terms of their past performance. So there's a whole data quality issue around the participants on top of that, I think. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, Monica or Ajit, do you have anything to add? I can add just a little bit to that. Um, I, I definitely agree there are some pilots out there. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, with the, we are trying to, to help spur some more of those pilots. Um, and really your question about data, that's actually one of the things we are really hoping to get um, from our connected communities work. Um, right now we're actually going through and thinking about MNV. And I think the question is how much data is needed and at sort of at what level is it needed um, in order to, to help with uh, valuing uh, the services. Um, I know that we are, we're also hosting um, actually next month a uh, discussion just around this question about MNV. So unfortunately, I don't have specifics on it other than saying I, I think it's a really important um, question to continue to um, you know do a deep dive on in, through some of these pilots yeah I'll just add a couple of notes there uh, it's, um, I mean we, we see a number of pilots in the distribution market space and uh, the biggest question is the driver uh, what, what is there real driver in doing this of course uh, there are different notions of uh, yes in a high DER scenario you may need a distribution market um, but um, yeah I mean but there could be even without a market there could be certain things that can be accommodated or the market framework can doesn't have to be an energy market it can be other types of flexible services that are enabled between the distribution utilities and the and the uh, and the entities participating in a bulk system service uh, but the biggest challenge 
would be the regulatory aspects associated with enabling a distribution market. Uh, it's not, um, uh, I think that type of aspects do not exist today. And uh, most of the pilots that we are looking at are also not looking at the regulatory barriers that needs to be addressed. Um, will there be a tariff mechanism in place? Uh, those are all questions that needs to be addressed. And um, there has to be more pilots focused on these specific drivers. That's, that's uh, what we are seeing on the markets, distribution market space. Okay, uh, next question uh, for you, Ajit. Will utilities or third-party distribution operators end up having to buy special software management systems dedicated to communicating and managing DERMs? Does this uh, system of software currently exist? Yeah, good question. Uh, the system or software definitely exists, uh, but the question is the need. Uh, do, we need, do I need a DERMS or the communication and control systems? Because there are challenges in terms of relying on uh, communication. So what if uh, your communication drops off when a DER is providing a grid service and particularly at the distribution, you don't have a fallback, right? In the bulk system, when an energy service is not provided, you have backup regulation reserves, of course. But in, in the case of um, distribution system, when a DER is providing a capacity service as a non wise alternative, what if it stops providing? You're talking about millions of dollars in terms of substation overloads or other types of issues. So um, the challenge is to, when it comes to DERMS deployment for, of course, the bulk system, for bulk system services, there's a lot of drivers and uh, um, as, as of now, there are methods, uh, mechanisms in place where DERMS is providing services to the bulk system. But when it comes to the distribution system for utilities, uh, most utilities today are using DERMS as a monitoring um, system to monitor what the DERs are doing. Uh, some aspect of controls is getting to be discussed, particularly in terms of seasonal controls, not active management. Uh, but what happens is eventually in a high DER penetration scenario, there are going to be economic drivers. There are going to be very good uh, quantifiable benefits, which can prove the value of DERMS to the distribution utilities. So that is going to drive the need. Uh, but in terms of technology offerings, yes, it is already there. We could we we, we do bring in a number of DERMS test in our uh, test beds, and we are we are seeing exceptional performances from the DERMS companies today. Thank you, Ajit. Uh, Mark, a question for you. You've worked on the topic of transacting energy. What is it, and what are some foundational requirements to get there? Okay. Uh, I have a couple of answers to that. I guess we're, we're running a bit low on time. So um, one of the things I'll do is give a plug to some work that uh, SEPA did, um, I think maybe 18 months, two years ago now, I should remember because I was involved in that. But uh, SEPA put together a transactive energy primer, which was intended to provide um, a high level overview of transactive energy uh, for people new to the concept. So it kind of talks around some of the basic um, ingredients, uh, if you were, um, and actually it has some example um, pilots in an appendix, appendix. so um, I think that's freely available on SEPA's website. Um, I'd recommend that. Um, the other thing, um, to give a, a quick plug for some work um, that NARUC is actually sponsoring um, in conjunction with John Topkins um, School of Advanced International Studies, um, there are a group of students currently uh, working on a project to look at what are the characteristics that would be good to um, create a, an environment conducive to transactive energy systems um, within states. Um, so looking at a, a range of uh, factors around whether they have, um, you know, what, what is the level of uh, microgrids there, you know, uh, what is the, uh, the policy stance with regards to renewable portfolio standards, a whole bunch of other things, but yeah, they're trying to come up with a, a, a way of, uh, of scoring um, how ready states are. And, and to Ajit's point earlier, I mean, one of the, the, the barriers um, that we're looking at right now is, is just from a policy perspective. And, and if, you, if, if I'm you know, across the street from you, John, and I'm selling you power uh, right now, if it's going over the utilities wires, I'm acting as a utility. Um, so, you know, that, that is, you know, the, the technology is there. But what are some of the other factors in terms of you know digitalization to uh, to facilitate that? Um, yeah, the, the, you know, there's, there's 
once the policy is, is clear, the you know I think uh, well you know, it, it's just a business model argument then. And in some places, um, people are actually doing this now. I I, I saw um, yesterday um, a question from Clifton uh, Bilo from um, New Hampshire. I'm not sure if he's on today, but um, the uh, where they are in New Hampshire, they uh, they actually have policy conditions that actually allow them to create a a small transactive energy um, system in their town. So you know it's. But, but I'd rec as, as an introduction, I'd recommend the CEPA primer. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, with that, we've reached the end of our time. I want to thank all the panelists for uh, providing us with some uh, good insights into what may be coming. And I'll pass it back to uh, Danielle.